Hello, everybody, and welcome to Lore Lords episode 40. And this one is very exciting. Um, I'm looking forward to it because I know a little bit of this, but Atlas is presenting the history of Nintendo. How exciting, right? It's a me, Atlas. Get it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I, it's the, so this is the second, this is only the second video game yeah. like history episode we've done. Yeah. Which That's is right because the yeah. episode two yeah. was mm -hmm. hip to be square. Episode, episode two, episode two was square, so we're gonna actually make a couple references to it because this takes place around the same time, most of it. Right. So, yeah. but yeah, I wanted to do one for a while, and it was actually uh, a, f uh, a friend of mine who said, "Like, I was just like, Jack, what's next week's gonna be?" And someone's like, "You should do Mario," and I was like, "No, you idiot!" <laughs> but I should do Nintendo. <laughs> So you What's know, wrong so we're with doing Mario no lore. nothing wrong with Mario. That could be its own episode. Uh, but so I figure I I like getting I like seeing the story of these famous companies and right. going all the way back to where they come from because they're usually very different. Which is no this which is the story of today as well. Yeah, for sure. And Nintendo is without question a very household name. Everyone knows Nintendo. Oh yeah, and they went through a lot of changes. From right. their beginning, and it's it's always cool to get to the root of the legend, you know. Yeah. Oh yeah, no. Nintendo is so known as well that like people would literally refer to video games as a Nintendo. Yeah. Like they'd you'd get a PlayStation, and then they'd be like, "Oh, go play a Nintendo." It's like, no, damn it. <laughs> like, yeah, almost like I can't remember what it's called, but when a brand becomes synonymous as an item, like Band Aid. Yeah. There's a word exactly, for it, yeah. but something like that, you know. So, uh, yeah, let's just get into it. Let's start talking about oh, yeah. Nintendo. Uh, this is the first. Is the, there's three parts to this episode. There, there are Get chapters to the to the le legacy of Nintendo. With part one, the card company. That's where it starts <laughs> yeah. off. There's a lot of people actually know about this. This, but we're gonna go yeah. into some details. So, in the city of Kyoto, Japan, Nintendo was founded on September 23rd, 1889. By Fuzajiro Yamauchi, which is, I think it's how you say it, Yamachi? Yamachi? Something around those lines. I'm going to be so. butchering a lot of names, so get ready. <laughs> um, yeah, when I found out that it was that old, I was like, I had to double take it. I was like, no shit, what? <laughs> yeah, the fact that it's over 100 is insane. And the fact that it's 100th anniversary was like, before video games were big, yeah. is another crazy. It's like weird to think about. Um yeah, so uh, Fujisiro Yamauchi founded a small company in Kyoto, Japan, 1889. He would name the company Yamauchi Nintendo. <laughs> and uh, this business would be for creating and selling Hanafuda, which are Japanese playing cards. And uh, the name Nintendo, uh, no one knows where it, what it actually means. There is a oh. legend, like in-company legend, that it means leave luck to heaven. But like it doesn't. Oh, okay, that's so that's dope. Though it doesn't it translate did, to that. So, so cool. it's just, like no one knows what that means. Like where that comes yeah. from, no one knows. Unfortunately, everyone involved is dead, so can't really oh, okay. get an answer about that. You know, it was a long right. time ago. Uh, but yeah, let's paint the picture of 1889, right in Japan, yeah. because that doesn't sound too long ago, like in the grand scheme of things, right? Um. And it, it's, yeah, it wasn't, you know, it was only, it's like, it's like what, sure. 120 years ago, 130 years ago. Yeah, but ago. like, think about the technology back then, yeah. think about everything that was going on. Yeah, exactly. Like in America, we had like the Wild West was at its peak um, yeah. thing, but we had like booming industry. Uh, I think automobiles were starting to exist kind of basically, uh -huh. you know, yeah. uh, in England, for example, that was the Victorian age that we, people right. love so much, you know. With like the horse and buggy, and the sky was black with smog. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but if you look at Japan, that's a very different picture because this was still the end of feudal Japan. It ended. A de it ended in 1868, so it's only right. 20 years after feudal Japan ended. So this is still like a lot of Japan is still very, very medieval in technology, but gr granted. This is in Kyoto, which is the capital. So if of advanced cities, this was the most advanced. But even then, it was still like 
the the last Samurai Rebellion was only ten years before this. That's crazy. Yeah, that so is nuts. that's that's the time period that Nintendo was founded in, and uh, <laughs> this was the beginning of the Empire of Japan as well. It's called the Meiji period because the Emperor of Meiji, right? Yeah, and uh, modern machinery was making its way into like all facets of life, including printing playing cards. Uh, a lot of companies would just start start using mass production for the first time. So there was now yep. factories to make things instead of everything being handmade. Uh, but Yamauchi would find his success in the fact that he would hand make his Hanafuda cards, which oh. in the big city was not very common. Um, and he, yes, yeah, again, you know, like I just said, mass production was starting. So he was like right, hand yeah. making playing cards, which imagine how expensive that would be nowadays. Uh, <laughs> yeah, to be fair, handmade is, you know, more, it, it feels better. You know, yeah, handmade but uh, like a de- I don't know how many deck cards are in a deck of Hanafuda, but I think it's 50-ish. It's similar to our Western plan cards. So like, that's a lot right. of cards to be handmaking, you know what I mean? Especially that if you're is, selling yeah. them in packs, like, that's a lot. <laughs> um, and uh, he would find success in this, because like what you were saying, it was nice. He would be like, in, in, in this era where tradition is being thrown away, for right. modernization and westernization people were still wanting to hold on to little bits of that life yeah and so and he, that, that, that's honestly a very wholesome and sentimental way to do it is yeah like a deck of playing exactly games. exactly so like, you have this little piece of tradition yeah. with you and so he was providing that and it got him popular yeah uh, it's good for him see and yeah the rapid westernization was in full effect. He was selling old style traditional cards in a big city like Kyoto too. He was probably the only person. Um, mm. And it, in a couple years, uh, Yamauchi had to expand Nintendo because there was just too many people for him to be hand making cards for. So he hired staff for the first time. Wow. Yeah. So he had staff uh, working. I think this is like eighteen ninety eight ninety one. Where they started. This is doing such it. humble beginnings. Yeah. This is like this. I I, I I didn't know how humble it was. I thought it was. I thought it was maybe he just got one of those printing things. But he's like, no, handmade, baby. Yeah. There's actually 1895. I think is the year it is. Uh, flyers for Yamauchi Nintendo in Kyoto. Like all the different cards they make, like uh, print ads, which are very very crazy to look at. There's not English on it at all. It's full Japanese, but like right. it's it's very interesting to see. Like, because you see the like the I looked it up what Nintendo would be in Japanese, so I could find where it was. You see that big brand name up top, Nintendo. Like, it's very weird. Um, That's so cool. <laughs> so yeah, the late at the turn of the century when he started to expand to get uh, cut uh, employees, he decided to go expand beyond Hanafuda and started making Western playing cards. Oh, yeah, which uh, is it's a that there's an interesting thing to talk about Western playing cards in Japan. Very taboo, yeah. even today. Yeah, that's, that's that's controversial. Western playing cards in Japan are kind of taboo today because gambling is one of the most hated practices in Japan. But yeah. with the tra- within the transition period from feudal to Western, and the empire rising, there was a lot of drunk gambling people. So, like, there was a lot that was on a rise. Who was actually making money selling the Western style playing cards? Um. So the first issue that they, he heard into with Nintendo was that he didn't have a son. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. Sounds like nothing to us, but in this time in Japan, this was how business worked. Uh, tradition dictates that your first son inherits your business upon your death or retirement. And since he had only daughters, he was in a bit of a pickle of what to do. So he actually ended up adopting his son-in-law. Uh Sekiro Kanada was his name, and then he became Sekiro Yamauchi. Um, so he took his stepfather's last name. So his he was now part of it, which is weird to think about, like yeah, that's what I was, lineage I was like, okay, wise, well. because your stepson is not your actual son who's married to your actual daughter. But there's no there's no inbreeding happening. But like as right. as far as like name le- like legacy goes, it's very weird looking, it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> So yeah, uh, we don't really have much history after that, after 1900, until 1929. Right. 1929 is the first time something major happens, which is when uh, Fusajiro Yamauchi retires from the company, uh, which is 30 years after its creation. And also, just think, the First World War happened, which didn't affect Japan that much. 
Right. But a lot of stuff did happen that time. There was the Ru- the Russo Japanese wars. There was mm. uh, you know, westernization happening. So it's a big technology jump. Yeah. And uh, he retired, and his son Sekiro would take over the company as president. And he would continue to print cards in the family business, and he would keep the family business doing well. The uh, business was slowly getting more and more popular as modernization led to more idle time, meaning more people were buying things like playing cards. Yay, money! Yeah, so he was making money off of the modernization because there was less people, you know, spending all day working and then sleeping. So <laughs> they were, right? They were have people had breaks for the first time. <laughs> yeah, breaks are great. Yeah, it's, it's great to breaks. great to have some idle time in your life. It was also the rise of popularity in gambling, like I mentioned before, in the early years of the right. empire, because there was that's not good. You know, subjugation was kind of happening, and right. people were being yeah. forced into different classes of society. Like, oh, you're a warrior class now, kind of <sighs> thing. Like, you're now yeah. samurai. Yeah. That was a big deal. You're all samurai now, which meant everyone's a lord. Really weird stuff happening. <laughs> anyway, people were getting a lot more alcohol, a lot more gambling. Started practices started happening in Japan. And so people started buying more Western playing cards. Uh, in 1933, Sekiro would end up establishing a joint venture with another card company, which I believe is what well, I couldn't even find the name for it. But at the time, they were they were the biggest manufacturing, mass produced Hanafuda card company in Japan, and they joint they joined together and renamed the company to Yamauchi Nintendo and Company. So he gained a lot of, he gained a couple factories, he gained a, an office, like he got a bigger, like, setup for the company now. Well, that's good. Yeah. So. They're really taking off now. Yeah, they're taking off. But if you know history, this is a bad, pretty bad time coming. Yeah, things are about to go down. Uh, Japan was pushing itself as the world's superior nation, according to them. And uh, they pretty much entered the Second World War from the get go. And uh, war was the war was throwing the world in t- turmoil. Uh, bad times all around. But uh, with this, Nintendo would continue to print its playing cards and selling even more to soldiers to take out. You know, Nintendo playing cards were a common thing to find in the Pacific. A lot of Nintendo playing cards we have today that are Hanafuda cards are from recovered from American soldiers in World War Two. That's pretty crazy because yeah. actually would... there's a lot of um did you ever play medal of honor games yeah uh Ri- medal of honor rising sun like there was a lot of references to like playing cards in it i remember like they're being like i don't know i just thought that was interesting yeah the, <laughs> in what in world war ii the japanese really fell into gambling like it was yeah. a big thing because i think they were just they were very corrupt and that kind of comes with it i guess you know like gambling sure. kind of it's, it's a side effect of like corruption uh, yeah. and they just kind of spread. And yeah, we have a lot of, uh, even Western Nintendo playing cards that were recovered by American soldiers That's because they were left behind. And, you know, they were in like, even like ration things sometimes would have like, or like, yeah. you know, not rations, like supply cases, they would throw in playing cards with soldiers. So like stuff like that. Um, right. and Nintendo was in the capital and they were printing tons of cards and they were, you know, popular. So that's the ones they That's would pick. Cool. Um, and during this time, the empire really wanted to push its image in the hearts and minds of people of Japan as the superior nation and as the best army and kind of stuff like that. And the, it, you know, the like they thought they were like the master race kind of idea, right? Yeah. And uh, multiple companies were brought on to make propaganda for them, and one such company was Nintendo. And what Nintendo made, which nowadays is one of the most expensive collectible things you can get for Nintendo. Oh, it was cool. a backgammon board that they made in 1943 for kids, and all the imagery depicts different animals wearing Japanese imperial uniforms to look like soldiers. And a lot of the images have these these animal soldier characters standing on and, or tearing up or burning American and British flags. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> oh, so, yeah, crazy. like intact versions of this are extremely valuable today. I bet. Yeah, that's like big war memorabilia, and the fact that it's branded Nintendo makes it even crazier collectible. Um, so yeah, that was that's all they really did in the war. It didn't really affect any of the family leading leadership involved. Um, 
And a few years later, 1947, after the war, uh, Sekiro would expand the business again by establishing a distribution company called Marufuku Co. Limited. And this would be okay. this would enable Nintendo to self distribute their Hanafuda cards, which and their other products, of course, uh, across of all Japan. Which this is a pretty normal step, I feel like, the natural growth of a company like that. Yeah. So yeah. it makes sense. But the reason they were able to was the post war Japan boom. Because almost mm -hmm. immediately after the Empire fell, the, another wave of Western modernization hit the country. Thankfully, in right. a good way this time where they became a democratic country in a lot of countries, including America, set up bases there and helped them get back on their feet. And uh, yeah. their post-war economy, even though they lost, was very good because the people were, were working very hard behind it. Rebuild. We talked about that in the Square Enix episode, too. Right. I do, yeah. Like, I they rebuilt that. the whole city that Square Enix was founded in, like, two months, basically. They just built a city. Pretty insane. Yeah, like, it's just, like, they got... They boomed, like, crazy after the war. Um... Nintendo got, you know, to, you know, they all those workers need something to do in their break, so you get playing cards. Right. Uh, <laughs> like, it's a very weird time. They were able to take advantage of of this, like, idleness in people, you know? Uh, yeah, I mean, there's good ways to go about it, and then there's scummy ways to go about it, and it sounds like they weren't too too bad. They were just trying to give people something to do. Yeah, no, they weren't, they weren't doing, like, a scummy thing at all, I don't think. It's just, like, they happened to be selling a product... Right. During a time, like exploit, yeah, yeah, for the it, first, it feels exploitive. Yeah, it's just like, but during this time, this is the first time people in Japan are like, I'm bored. Let's play cards, you know, kind of thing. That never really happened yeah. in the past before. So like now, it's like everyone's doing it. So this little trick, Hanafuda card guy, just started like exploding, you know. <laughs> uh, so Sekiro, however, would find that history was repeating itself because all his kids were daughters. Uh oh. Yeah. So women can't run. Women businesses. can't run companies. No, that'd be ridiculous. Imagine. Uh, imagine. <laughs> yeah. Oh so even God. even post empire, the empire was gone. The tradition still reigned supreme at this point in a lot of aspects of Japan. It still does today, in a lot of weird little ways. But uh, this is not one of them, luckily. But <laughs> but uh, he needed a male heir for the presidency of Nintendo. So he would do what his father did and adopt his daughter's son, his daughter's husband, his son-in-law, Shikanoyo Inaba, who would once again take on his stepfather's name, becoming Shikanoyo Yamuchi. Yamauchi? I don't know how to say it. Um, he would be next in line for president, but soon Shikanoyo had a son with his wife. And so since he had a son with, while he had the name Yamauchi, he naturally took the name Yamauchi. Right. And uh, he was born he, he, Hiroshi Yamauchi, which, if you know your game history, that's the Yamauchi. This is the one who was president of Nintendo, I think, 2007. So this is the one. <laughs> um, <laughs> his dad, Shikanoyo Yamauchi, however, abandoned his family when he was born and ran oh, away. Fuck. Okay. So uh, Hiroshi ended up actually being raised by his grandparents, including Sekiro. So he was raised to be the next president for the company. Like he was raised in the company, basically. That's a sad way to live life. It's a sad way to live life, but he was a. Per I think he passed away not that long ago. He was a pretty cool guy. Like he was a cool dude. Right. So he did he and you know he worked a cool company. Like it was a cooler side right. of companies. You know what I mean? It's not like being a sure. weird like baron of some crazy like <laughs> like corporate state. It was like he was he made games and toys. Like, right. like, you know what I mean? Like, it's kind of cool. Um, it is kind of cool. Right. So he was raised in the money of Nintendo, and that allowed him to attend Waseda University in Tokyo, which is the same one we talked about in the Square Enix episode, where all those people went. Oh, yeah. Same university. Wow. Um, but unlike them, Yamauchi would actually never get to graduate because his oh. grandfather Sekiro passed away in his freshman year. Oh. Uh, and because of that, he had to leave school to assume the chair of president of Nintendo in 1950. Oh, he was probably not very prepared for that. No, uh, well, uh, he he did pretty good, I think. You know, I mean, he kind of kept things status quo at first for a couple yeah, of years. Okay. You know, well, he didn't really change as long much. As you can do that. Yeah, everything it was, was a smart plan. yeah, everything was just going. He did his first thing. He did was in 1953. That was major. He renamed Marufuku Co Limited to Nintendo Karuta. Karuta is a popular game played with the Hanafuda cards. Oh, okay. Uh, so that was his distributing company. 
And uh, he, in 1953, the same time, he would transition the company to print cards using plastic over paper for the first time. And he okay. was the first company in Japan to do so. This was a practice taking over in America. Like the cards you have today, they're plastic. Um, you could get like Hoyle playing cards, you know? They're, they they, sure, they sure. look like they're cardboard. They're plastic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so this was a huge deal. And the uh, nice feel of the cards and how how resistant to like tear they were made them more popular than ever. And Nintendo became the prominent card seller not only in Japan but in Asia at the time. Outside outside of China, oh. outside of China, we're not including China, <laughs> but like of Hanafuda cards, they were number one basically. Right. Um. So the next step for them was to uh, look for expansion outside of Japan. Uh, so Yamauchi did what you do, and he visited the United States of America. Welcome. Yeah. In 1956, he came, took a trip to Cincinnati, and the reason okay. he went to Cincinnati is because this was the office of the United States Playing Card Company, known as the USPCC, which uh, was the dominant playing card sellers in all of North America, and were possibly looking to make deals with Nintendo to sell their product in Japan, and Japan to sell their and for Nintendo to sell their Hanafuda cards in North America. Um, and since, as you probably know, we don't even know what those are out here. The deal didn't go yep. through. Uh, yep. <laughs> but uh, the reason why the deal didn't go through is Yamauchi actually backed out because when oh. he arrived, he was pretty upset at how small their office was. <laughs> and it's not like that sounds like a weird thing to say like he's like you're so poor like, not not that that's not the reason his office was right. smaller than theirs he was upset that this is the biggest company for playing cards and this is how small their office is oh it was more of a overarching yeah thing, like he's so like he's like oh that. this is my okay. future kind of thing like <laughs> and he's so that was when he realized the playing cards can only get nintendo so far it's true. So at this time, he began, he wanted to expand his business, and he still wanted to work with Americans. Uh, so he was looking for other companies. He kept going between America and Japan, meeting with people, and finally ended up settling a deal with his, his uh, according to him, his favorite company in America. Oh. Um, in 1959, he made a deal with Disney. Oh, oh, wow. Yeah, which is huge. And especially in the 59, that's like Disney, like, that's like Disneyland, like, you know, all the yeah. movies are popping kind of thing. So yeah, he made a he made a deal with Disney in '59, and this was a huge deal for Nintendo because they were now allowed to use Disney's name and imagery on their cards. That's huge. Yeah. So in Japan, uh, he was started to focus also on Western style playing cards. The you know the four suit numbers and faces we know today. You know regular playing yeah. cards does. Uh, these were looked down upon in Japan, like you mentioned before, because they were seen for use in gambling. And, like, literally advertisements that were like, don't let your kids gamble, would show pictures of these cards. <laughs> like, that was, like, the icon. It was, like, the king right. card. I think the king of hearts was the toe, which still is in Japan, like, the logo for, like, the word gamble, basically. Huh. So Nintendo saw the Disney deal as a great opportunity to remove this taboo, as well as see sell a popular product to kids. And what they did is they would sell the cards with books, and the books would teach kids all the different games you can play with playing oh, cards. You, yeah, and not only do the cards have Disney characters on them, but the books were like little Disney stories, like Cinderella <laughs> or like you know stuff like that. And it would have like, oh, Cinderella was playing blackjack. Here's how you play. <laughs> I'm assuming there were card, there were games like Bridge and stuff like that. Like sure. not like not the gambling. He was, I think they were trying to specifically not, not like do. War. They don't teach the kids war. Well, they probably honestly they probably did. I mean they could do like Peter Pan oh, war, you know, because that's not a gambling <laughs> game. It's not like they could fair. do it that that's way. That's true. Uh, Blackjack. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess you could do with Alice in Wonderland. They all have they're all playing card, right? You Texas could do hold them. Yeah, that's true. You could do that one too. <laughs> Cinderella's Texas hold them. <laughs> The Disney Kingdom Hold'em. That's what it's called. Um, so, yeah, this actually was a huge success from Nintendo. Uh, they sold over 600,000 pack card packs a year. And they were becoming... In, like, every house. West were ha Every house in Japan, for the first time, was having Western-style card packs. And, hey. yeah, they were becoming a normal household item. And Nintendo was starting to become a household name because of it. 
Congratulations, guys. Yeah, they're finally making it. And uh, this actually, what this did, this amount of money they made from this, was what was allowed the company to go public. And they were able to list themselves in the Osaka Stock Exchange Second Division. Wow. So yeah, this is this is going into 1960. So like they in 1960 they became public, huge deal for a company to reach that level. Uh, so Yamauchi was doing good, you know, he was doing a good yeah. job. And as a larger company, he finally decided to rename the company for the market to the name we know today, just Nintendo. It's so clean; it means nothing, and it sounds cool. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it doesn't even it doesn't even sound like. I guess I associate it with Japan today, but like if you kind of think about it, it doesn't sound Japanese. It just sounds like a word. Uh, it, yeah, I guess you're right. Just I never Nintendo. thought about it like that. Like <laughs> you know, it has no like accent to it. Just Nintendo. That's how it is. Uh. It's it says as it's spelled. Um, so yeah, he was uh, he renamed it. It was he was a public company, and Yamauchi officially declared it was time to end the playing card business. This was he oh, was he wow. couldn't get much bigger than this, so he they kept making them, you know, but they like right. weren't gonna they weren't fo- that wasn't the focus anymore. Right. So with his newly injected capital, he had some room to play with new ideas, and between sixty three and sixty eight are some of the craziest Nintendo stories you can find. Um, mm-hmm. The first thing they did was they made a taxi company. Uh, oh, so this is very okay. short-lived, but yeah, somewhere out there there's Nintendo taxis, which are kind of wild to think about. That's crazy. Yeah, it wasn't a very short-lived product project, but I, also a weird, that's a weird first go-to from playing cards to me. Like, you went to taxis, huh? That was your... <laughs> There must have been some inspiration, like he was having trouble finding taxis, you know? Like, that must have been, like, mild. That's the only thing I can think of. Uh, the next one he did was he made a food company, which would actually be the longest of these short products. There was Nintendo Food. They made, like, instant noodles, like, uh, instant rice, those kind of things. Sure. Uh, but they also made the, the Chiritori. Chiritori? Do you know what that is? No. Because I had never heard of this before. Um... It's a Nintendo branded vacuum cleaner. And the reason why I mention this is apparently it is one of the most sought out collectible items in the world for Nintendo collectors. Oh, okay. Um, cause they were like produced and sold like in mass. Like there's a lot of them out there, but they're hard to find now. Uh, it's just like a little red round vacuum with says Nintendo on it. And it's in WarioWare, like every WarioWare game, the Nintendo ch- Chirichiri is oh. in it. I know what it looks like. Yeah. yeah cause I know from Wario. Okay. Yeah. So that's like, so it's like, so I think that's why. It's so popular. It's because it showed up in in WarioWare, so they kind of like exploded. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, and then after the food the food company, which is great, they made the um, they made a love hotel chain. What does that mean, Atlas? Please explain. To a me. love hotel, Pat, is a is a hotel where you go fuck someone. <laughs> It's, you know, to be honest, for a second there, I really thought like, "Hey, maybe I'm. Maybe it's not just that. <laughs> maybe there's something else to it." And, okay. So I looked into it for this because I wanted to know more. Like, like what? Why is this a thing? There's still a thing in Japan commonly today. It's not. And does Nintendo still own it? No, Nintendo didn't do it very long. That was. A very, I think it was only like about a year they had this business. But yeah. Well, let's try these fuck hotels out. Let's give yeah. them a shot. You know what people really like doing? Fucking and. Oh, fucking. We could give them a card deck in every room. Uh, I can get late sponsored <laughs> by Nintendo. All the back vacuums are those little Chitori things. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's a ho- th- this, this practice actually started up after the World War in Japan, where there was these little hotels these were opened up, where instead of in America, for example, I don't know about other places in the world, but in America, when you get a hotel, it's a night is the minimum an overnight stay. You get the room and you have it for 24 hours, basically. That's like your thing. In Japan, they started doing it by the hour, which you can do with some hotels here, but commonly, commonly, that's not the case. So in Japan, they they, they know what that's for. They made it for that reason. And you'll see giant advertisements. They'll say hotel with a heart icon next to it. That's all that means. Love hotel. You know, you know, it's kind of funny. Hmm. Uh, I think we talked about this in the Naruto episode, how like it kind of takes place 
like with that kind of technology and that level. Now that I think about it, they have those in Naruto. Like there are signs that have hearts on it and that say a hotel and that point in and stuff. And that's where like what Jiraiya is obsessed with. Yeah, it's that's a, it's a like. it's a known thing among people in Japan. Like you grow up around them, so you know they exist. You know, and they and they yeah, know what they're for. They're very candid about it. It's not like hidden. Right. It's not like he he. It's secret. Like no, it's a love hotel. You go there to get naked with ladies. Um, yeah, they did and that. Gentlemen. And gentlemen, yeah. Anyone nowadays? Uh, they uh, they they did that for a year. So maybe someone out there has some Nintendo branded love hotel flyers or something. I don't know. That's pretty cool. That would be really cool. Uh, that didn't that that didn't last long. So all these ventures failed except for one, which I didn't even mention, which is the toy company. The Legend of Zelda. No, no, not yet, not yet. Too early. <laughs> Nintendo made a, a toy company, which I feel like is a very logical step from playing cards. Like it makes sense to me. Sure, I, that's where I honestly thought they were gonna go. So when you said food, yeah, like love hotels, and I was like, okay, guys, yeah, like, which it wasn't the first idea because like toys is which uh, the reason they were successful is because of their knowledge of the card business. So like it's weird right. that they did this, like they did this kind of like step. Uh, but yeah, eventually they had. The toy company, Nintendo Toys. And in 1963, Japan would experience an economic boom, thanks to the Tokyo Olympics. Oh, yeah. Great. Yeah, but at this time, playing cards reached the saturation point. People just legitimately stopped buying playing cards in Japan. Like, they couldn't sell, like, a Everybody single pack. It, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Everyone had them. Everyone had them. Nintendo's stock dropped from 900 yen to 60 yen. Yeah, it's a big fall. It's a big fall. They 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 felt this. Um, but behind closed doors, Nintendo big changes right. were afoot. And that then and the next thing that came out, you know it, The Legend of Zelda. No, Twilight no, Princess. no. Wait, wait, no. no especially not, not. Especially not that one. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be talking about that this episode, but not not. Uh, which, for the record, I didn't even yeah, mention. I, you'll see it in the title if you're listening or watch, live or watching this. But this is part one. There is going to be a part two right. next week for this. Yeah. Uh, Nintendo story. Um, so yeah, what was happening behind closed doors? There was big changes afoot because they hired an electrical engineer for an assembly line at their factory named Gunpei Yokoi. Uh, do you know that name? No. Okay. Uh, he would soon become famous, and his name is still recognizable today. If you know game, if you're into game history and development stories, he is big. So he is a big name coming up, and he was hired as a assembly line maintenance guy basically <laughs> at nintendo but he would, wouldn't become famous for that he would become famous for something quite different i can't yeah I, that'd be pretty amazing if he became famous for that yeah so uh part two is beginning now we're going into the 60s it's part two called the toy company so part one That's was the goal. card company. Part two is a toy company. Okay, do you see what I'm doing here? So the sixties, so, <laughs> the sixties saw the first, <laughs> the first struggle for Nintendo. They would ha be having to survive the Japanese toy industry, which, while the market was small, it was dominated by two giants who were so well established the worldwide knew them. Which you might know these. First one was Tommy, T O M Y. You know that brand? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. They make, I think they make a lot of like little little kid toys. Like it's like kind of like their thing. Yes. And the other one, which I know for sure, you know, Bandai. Oh yeah, big time baby. So Tomy and Bandai were these. I think it's Tomy's. I say it. They were the big giants, corporate CEO. You know, dominating yeah. forces in the toy market. But uh, Yamachi noticed something in the market, and that was that toys had a short product life. Uh, fads would come and go faster than products would come on the shelves. And most toys, from like Bandai, for example, would sell two months and then just stop selling. And additional units would not be ordered because they would just not be selling. So they would just sit in backstock rooms, right? And Bandai would make a new product only about three times a year. Which, if you paid attention to, to the two-month thing, that is not efficient. Not good. That, no. <laughs> but they were still That's big. A lot of downtime. They were still big. Sure. There just wasn't new products, basically. So... Right. This is what Nintendo would do to change things up. They would produce products at a much faster rate with a new product every month. And this would have them enter the race at a very good pace. And while it was difficult to keep up, it did work. And they were able to expand and make sales and open new factories. So this begins the major era for the company in the toy business. 
1966, Yamauchi would pay a visit to one of the company's major factories, and there he would notice by the side of a desk was a little extending arm toy to grab things. You know what I'm talking about? They're like those little graspers, yeah, yeah, yeah. little hands. Yeah. Yeah. Common nowadays. Old, old, people, old people got them. Yeah. Common nowadays, back then, unheard of. Mm. Uh, when he asked about it, he was told, oh, this is nothing. It was created by our maintenance worker, Gunpei Yokoi. Oh. And he went, oh, I want to talk to this man. So we talked to him in a meeting, and everyone at the factory thought he was getting fired for making that instead of fixing the assembly lines, you know what I mean? <laughs> but what was right. actually happening is he was so into this idea that he ordered Yokoi to stop being a maintenance guy and to make this product fully developed in time for Christmas. Oh, and hell yeah, dude, thank, he's got a fucking yeah, big old pay raise. Big. And uh, luckily for him, he was able to produce results, and the Nintendo Ultra Hand was made. If you look this up, you'll find it. It's a pretty famous item, the Nintendo Ultra Hand. It's, it's the precursor to the Power Glove. Oh, God, I mean, except it it, reach, <laughs> it reaches out, but close. You could put a Power Glove on it, maybe. Anyway, this is the standard extending grabbing toy. You know, we all know what it is, like we talked about earlier, but this was the first one, basically. Yeah. At least in Japan, it was the first one. And uh, it was the first blockbuster toy to be sold by Nintendo, and not only rapidly selling, but it put the Nintendo toy name on the map. Hell yeah, way to go, guys. And after selling hundreds of thousands of units, Yamauchi saw Yokoi's great potential and moved him from maintenance into a leadership position in product development. Oof, that goes from minimum wage yes, to maximum wage. Yes, that is minimum wage to maximum wage. And this would prove to be a very smart move for the future Nintendo. Yokoi's background in electrical engineering would show his ability to develop electronic toys, which were hmm. very novelty at the time. But... Right. With novelty comes high cost. So right. they were able to make toys that would sell a lot. And the first one was called the 10 billion barrel puzzle. Kind of hard to describe. I would just yeah, Google it to look up what it is. It's a plastic cylinder that kind of works like a Rubik's Cube. 10 billion dollar? 10 billion barrel puzzle is what it's called. It's like a little barrel. plastic barrel. And there's versions of it made today. Like I've never seen one before. I don't know if it's just like a popular Japanese thing. But when I search it, there's versions today you can buy. Um, oh, I know. I've seen these things. Yeah, like I, pro I think I've seen them, but I don't really know what they are. Anyway, it was, it was a Rubik's Cube-like puzzle design in a cylinder, and it sold very well. So it kept Nintendo going. And after that, he created the Ultra Machine, which is a softball launcher for practicing playing softball. <laughs> if one, Say, friend, could, one right. friend could hold the, shot, the softball gun and shoot at you while you hit him kind of thing. Um, right. And then next, we saw the, his most famous toy. Or infamous, rather, maybe, toy. The, the Legend of Zelda. Uh, nope. Nope, no. Okay. Cl close. Close. <laughs> but not yet. This is going to be the, the Love Tester. Have you heard of the Love <laughs> Tester for Nintendo? Oh my god, what is this? <laughs> this? It was a small device with two metal spheres. Uh -huh. And the instructions oh, no. said a man touches one and a woman touches the other while you hold hands. And okay. on, the, on the little display screen, it shows your love score. Okay. Yeah. So uh, that came out, and it was said, it said that it was uh, even hot. You could raise your love score by kissing the girl while you're doing it. But how do they know? How do they know you're kissing the girl when it's it just that's too early your love technology? It raise your love score. Don't question the technology. Just go with the flow, man. Is it like a heartbeat monitor? Maybe no. There's 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 up? no technology behind this. It just reads electricity in your body. <laughs> it doesn't kissing the girl kissing real. the curl doesn't they said it was kissing the girl doesn't raise they anything <laughs> surprisingly surprisingly so this product it would sell fairly well but that's not the legacy it has it is basically a joke especially inside nintendo today like it is a constantly referenced thing by nintendo and you'll see it pop up in things uh for example in animal crossing new leaf and i think new horizon you can get one for your house no way you that's can awesome. get a nintendo love tester um uh, I think they added it in the DLC. One of the DLC items was a love tester for the New Horizons game. Uh, it's also in every WarioWare game. There's a puzzle where you stand on two electric like pan like paddles, oh, yeah. and that's the love tester machine. Like it shows it in the background. Oh my god! And, like that's the score so has like a heart and stuff. Like it's that. In the Legend of Zelda, Majora's oh. Mask, oh. the love tester is an Easter egg. You can find a love tester in that game. It's in the 3D version, not the original version. So the Game Boy oh. version. Um, oh. they put it in. 
I think I think it's like in a store or something. You can see it on the shelf. Fuck! Now I gotta. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta find it. Uh, so yeah, the legend would also be re- renewed to reality in 2010 when the company Tenyo, uh, which was fully endorsed by Nintendo, released the product again. It still sells it today in its original packaging <laughs> with its original instructions. With the Nintendo brand on it and everything. You can just get it now, which is fine. They're like 50 bucks. It's funny. Um, 1970, Nintendo would release a product called the Beam Gun. This is huge. This is huge. The Beam Gun? The Beam Gun. This product, what we know today as a light gun, or the Zapper, was a device Uh that would reflect would have reflective lenses inside to register an input with equipment that required a a light gun. Which those were popular for toys at the time. I don't know if you've seen light gun games. They're like they're like a thing people would you put a film over your TV. You know what I'm talking about? No. I've seen them before. I think they're they're, they're called like like light gun toys or light gun game systems, and it's basically like a reflective okay. thin piece of plastic that you stret that you like lay over your television, like over the screen, and it's got like a HUD on it, and like you would be able to like point your light gun at it, and it would like reflect you're hitting a target basically. Okay. Um, so that was kind of like rising in popularity at this time in America, at least. I'm assuming Japan that, like, too. Precursor to the Duck Hunt. Yes, very much. Except without think without a game element, it was literally just like a static thing you would put on your TV and like point your thing at and shoot, and then how fast you could mm-hmm. do it would like give you a score kind of thing. Uh, but the okay. thing that made the beam gun popular, Nintendo beam gun, is it didn't have a power cord. It had a solar panel. Ah. So this is the first cordless one, and one of the biggest problems the market with Lycans at the time was getting like kids having their feet tangled up in them because they would have these long cords. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, this made it very popular, and it kind of became the dominant light gun in Japan. Uh, and the product would make would be made in partnership with Sharp, the the electronic okay. company, uh, yeah, yeah, which yeah. they would work with a lot in for electronics in the future as well. Even today, they still work with Sharp. Uh, in 1972, Nintendo would release Eleconga, which was a programmable drum machine. This would play Ooh. pre-programmed rhythms that you could make on paper disc punch cards. Oh! So the user was able to like punch little holes in a card oh, and put it in I there. Know those. Yeah, they're those they're pop things. nowadays. They're super popular in like very very small forms, but back then it was like a big right. machine, you know. Um, and uh, this would be the last major so- toy sale for Nintendo before their next major venture, which started in the same year, 72. Um, oh. And this is where we enter part three, the game company. You see what I did there? It went toy company to, 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 to game company. And it's a card company, toy company. Do you, you see? Like, it's like, <laughs> anyway. I, I, yeah. No, I so, don't. Can you explain? So, like, it's like the three. Anyway, anyway I want to go on. In uh, 1972. Same year as the uh, Elekanga, yes. we saw the release of the Magnavox Odyssey in Japan. Do you know what the I know. Ma- yeah, yeah. yeah yeah the Hell first yeah. ever video game console? This would feature a light gun based accessory called the Shooting Gallery, and this was Nintendo's first involvement in the game in- industry. C- because can you guess whose light gun they wanted to use? They wanted to use Nintendo's. That's right, Pat. The Beam Gun. Okay, yeah, the bean gun. Yeah, oh. yeah, so which is actually kind of kind of an interesting thing to know is that Nintendo actually was involved with the Magnavox starting in 1970, right. two years before oh. the console launched, oh. and this was all it's behind like closed they doors. Planned it. Yeah, well, it was, but it was behind. They didn't like announce this. This was like a secret thing that they were working with an American company called Magnavox to develop and, and produce Honestly, the product. That's yeah. genius that they did because this is th- that is such a big fucking deal. That yeah. is such a like that's like that's the new thing. That's literally the some of the start of the new thing. So they had to be secret. Yeah, Although they weren't they weren't that. talking about it. And then sure enough, they made it, and people were approaching them like, "Oh, buy our light gun." They're like, "Nope, we already got one. We got the Nintendo Beam Gun." Exactly. So yeah, it would come out with this little thing called the Shooting Gallery, which was eventually basically Duck Hunt, like a very very basic right. version. You know, you can, as you can imagine, the most basic. This is Pong era, so the most right, basic yeah. version of that kind of thing. A Nintendo Beam Gun would continue its journey to success following the shooting gallery release of the Odyssey with Nintendo's next major venture. This would be something called the Laser Clay Shooting System. Now, I'd never heard of this before. No, I uh, so this was weird, very weird to me. And it sounds like kind of a great time, honestly. Uh, this was a light gun-based shooting simulation game using an overhead projector that would display oh. moving targets on the back behind the background. 
Now, this was too expensive and large for home sale, so Nintendo would use abandoned bowling alleys and open up laser clay shooting galleries. That's kind of fun. Yeah, so that imagine like sick. giant duck hunt in a bowling alley, yeah. like a sized b- building. Like that's that the thing. Sounds awesome. Yeah, I really hope Got a I, couple drinks with your friends. Yeah, I found a couple ads for them. I, I was thinking, like, man, that'd be such a cool poster to have, like an ad to go to like a Nintendo laser clay shooting thing. And yeah, they had they had. I don't know if they had alcohol, but they did have food and drinks available. So it was like that kind of business, you know, like a bowling alley kind of thing. Yeah, which is awesome. I'm super down with that. Yeah, so they would use these abandoned bowling alleys and set up these locations. They would sell tickets for their games. And they would use a beam rifle, which was just the beam gun, but like big. Uh, So you could like (laughs) put it in your shoulder to feel like you're shooting more accurately for fake reasons. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because Emer- it's immersion yeah immersion because it uses the same technology same exact thing it was just a beam gun using reflections on the surface to see if a target was hit and the technology for this whole thing also for the record was developed by Gunpei Yokoi he invented this whole to all the tech was his mind that's really amazing but the concept actually came from Yamauchi himself so they worked together on it but Yamauchi had the okay. idea like let's make a shooting gallery digitally because, you know, we don't really have... He was just like, gotcha. And he's like, that sounds crazy cool. Let's do it. We already have the beam gun. And uh, yeah. it was a commercial success. These venues would open up all around Kyoto for a while and became very popular for as evening activities among the city. Yeah, I bet. However... That sounds like a fun... Yeah. That's like a blast. Day. No, that, have, that's 100%. 100%. 100%. Like, it's very arcade style, bowling alley style, yeah. like entertainment. Like, it almost... I could see a reality where this took off. And state as a thing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, imagine nowadays what you could do with this kind of stuff, like digital shooting kind of things. Oh, yeah. Like, That's it could so be, cool. it could be like a crazy, that could be a crazy thing. Um, so, yeah, however, despite it being a success, the excessive costs of running the venues would become a problem because in 1973, we would see the oil crisis hit Japan. Mm, yeah. So, the 73 74 oil crisis was, you know, it's a pretty big world event. Uh, oh, Sa- yeah. Saudi Arabia embargoed oil on nations who sided with Israel in the Yom Kippur War. That's what happened. Uh, yeah. And uh, USA and Japan were hit pretty hard, specifically. Uh, this, of course, had major impacts and what's caused the stock market in 73, 74 to crash in America. And is a good example today as to why history is important to look at. <laughs> anyway, the... <laughs> the oil crisis led Nintendo into a 5 billion year debt. Sorry, 5 billion yen debt. A year. <laughs> they were in, they were in debt five billion years. They were into a debt for a five billion yen, which is a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And they were on the verge of bankruptcy. So they had to shut down all their laser clay shooting venues. Very mm-hmm. sad, I know. Sad times. Uh and this is the first time ever that the company was at a major loss. So Yamauchi's attempted uh Yamauchi's attempt to revive the company was making a smaller, cheaper version of the laser clay shooting system in 1974 called the Mini Laser Clay. <laughs> Get creative. Yeah. Uh, a way literally is what it was. But this was an arcade cabinet. That's right. And it was able to oh. host multiple games using the beam rifle and be able to be deployed in arcades instead of whole venues. It was big. Kind of, I, I, from what I, it's actually really hard to find pictures of this. Um, mm. when you look it up, you mostly just find the machine. But from what I could gather, it's kind of like those like bass fishing shops with like the 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 golf game. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I do. that's kind of like what it was. <laughs> that's so specific. Yeah, but I know exactly they what you're ha- talking if about. You, that, that fucking golf game. Yeah, right? where you hit the golf and you see it go yeah. digitally off into the, the like that thing. That yeah, seems yeah, that yeah. seems like that's how like big it was. Like it was like a screen. That's so funny. Um. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, luckily for Nintendo, this was a huge success, bigger than the original Laser Clay. Uh, and they were selling, basically selling out of the machines to every every arcade in Japan. And this got them out of their financial situation. They didn't have to get a loan or anything. They were good. Good job, Nintendo. Solved it yourself. Good job. Yeah. Man, that that's the way it's supposed to be. Yes. It. Yes, it Sink is. Sink or swim, bitch. Yep. They, and they swam. They swam higher, and it keeps oh, going yeah. higher. Because of the markets of arcades discovered, Nintendo forever changed. They realized Nintendo the arcades were the future, and it began to shift its entire focus on video games and the arcade market. Let's go. Its first steps in the field was to acquire the rights to distribute none other than the Magnavox Odyssey in Japan, which they got in 1974. 
So Nintendo was actually selling the Magnavox Odyssey. They were the only company in Japan doing so. Let's go. Which, due to their already solid partnership, you know, Magnavox is like, yeah, of course you guys can, kind of thing. Yeah, right. Uh, Nintendo had sites on arcade, had their sites on arcades, and how profitable the mini laser clay was, and it proved to them that they could make a lot of money selling cabinets, and that the arcade business was not shrinking but growing rapidly. Oh yeah. As especially in Kyoto, arcades were opening up on like every corner, and Nintendo was being a relatively known brand. They decided to make arcade games, and their first yeah. game they made it was called Ever Race, E V R Race, which I'd never heard of. So I looked into this. Nope. Uh, released 1975, it is widely considered to be the first video game made by Nintendo. Some people argue that and say it's not a game, and you'll see why. Uh, <laughs> this cabinet was massive. It was like the size of three pinball machines, firstly. Oh, Jesus Christ. Uh, and it had, because it was six player. And the screen displayed a horse race. And what you would do is each player would stand at either one of the six stations and make bets on which horse would win. Oh, yeah, I just looked it up uh, on my phone, and that looks ridiculous. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Looking. It's got EVR race, if you want to look it up. It's an absurd machine. It's massive. Uh, I've seen those, actually, I think. Yeah, there's there's modern versions of this thing. And like even, like, bars yeah. have them sometimes. Because it's, like, it it's, like, it's, like, it's like minor gambling. Like, you would gamble actual money on these machines kind of thing. <laughs> you know, like, like right. quarters. And so a lot, of, a lot yeah. of, like, bars today have this kind of thing or stuff like that. Like little horse racing games. Um, yeah. So due to its large size and complicated inner workings, it would actually break down all the time. <laughs> and some of the six, one of the, like, the six player stations would like, they would, one would just break or like turn off and you'd have to like get oh. a whole new one or get a repair guy from Nintendo out to your arcade. Uh, this was the lesson for Nintendo to learn how difficult it can be to maintain arcade games and like oh. how to make them better, but it did turn a profit. So it was like, a, it was a lesson learned, but they did make money out of it, you know, not as much as they probably like, could have, yeah. but it was a very complicated machine. I also saw that it was actually like one of the first games to use true RNG with the horse racing. Oh. So that's why it was so complicated. It would just break. Like the RNG would break. It would stop being RNG. Like the same horse would win for 50 races in a row. Because it was just too <laughs> complex for circuit boards and stuff at the time. That's funny. So in 1977, they teamed up with a new company, Mitsubishi Electric, to, oh, to develop okay. their first game console. Now, this game console was called the Color TV Game 6. And they would also sell another version that was slightly more expensive called the Color TV Game 15. Uh, wow. Yeah, crazy name. So do you know why they had those numbers? Can you guess why those numbers are on their name? What, what were the numbers? Six, Six and, and 15? 15, yeah. I have no fucking clue. That's, those are so random. That's how many games were on them. Oh, yeah. okay. So here's the kicker. They're all Pong. <laughs> it's all Pong. Every There's, game was Pong. You want 15 versions of Pong? That's what there it was. Literally what That's it was. Ridiculous. Bigger paddles, That's faster so ball. One paddle's bigger than the other. Every combination. Oh you know what God. I mean? The six on the cheaper one, 15 of the more expensive one. Nintendo yeah, had to... Video games in the 70s. Yeah, it was limited it light pickings. <laughs> Nintendo acquired a license from Magnavox to make a clone of Pong, which they got, which is what that was. <laughs> uh, Gimachi would make sure the device was made as cheap as possible to, turn, to make it affordable for the average Japanese household because people weren't buying Magnavoxes because also, for the record, they were like $1,000 equivalent oh, wow. back then. They were very Christ. expensive. Um Lord. Because it was also, it was like, it was, it wasn't like a video game, right? It was like electronic. Like it was like a fancy, like box, you know what I mean? That people didn't understand. So it was, it was very high priced for, you know, novelty reasons. Sure. So uh, both these consoles featured only Pong, like I mentioned, one having six versions, one having 15 versions. Uh, and uh, this would product, when it released, it was a lot cheaper than any of its counterparts. And it would sell much higher than the competitions would. And uh, one is also for the record. One came out, the six came out, and the fifteen came out literally a week later, which is hilarious. Okay, I love that yeah. they just released the same thing with more pong variants a week later. It's also like white instead of orange. <laughs> Weird. Um, I got the six, guys. I got the six. It looks really stupid. Like, if you Google search what this thing looks like, it's really dumb looking. I, I really hate it. <laughs> it almost wait, kind of upsets me because it's ridiculous. Color like TV game. The, color if you go TV Nintendo game. Color TV game, like 6 and 15, you'll see it. Probably, there's a whole series. You probably might find all the 
versions of it, right? Oh, I've I've seen the uh, the oh god, yeah, this is awful. Yeah, it kind of irritates. It looks me. like a pedal board for a guitar. Yeah, it honestly. does. It does. You're right. It does look like that, and it it makes me think of like those really shoddy knockoff consoles people make today. You know what you should do? You should pick up those things and you could use them for sets to make it look like you're on a spaceship. You know what I mean? And pulling random knobs and tubes. Yeah, your perfect. Spaceship. It's good for set design. There you go. Per- you're, you're right. That's yeah. a great idea. Um, <laughs> so yeah, that those came out. And uh, they weren't done because the third console was in the way, buddy. And you know what that is. The Color TV Racing 112 would come out in June 1978. Only a, yeah, yep. And only a year after the previous ones. To the the week, I believe, too. Can you guess why it's called 112? Because it has 112 games on it. 112 variations of Speed Race, the popular arcade racing game. So one okay. version would be like, oh, the blue car's faster. The red car's faster. Right. The red car's slower. You know, so you can see how you could do 112 variations. Uh it was Oh my gosh. It was the thing. It's got a little wheel on it. It was kind of cool looking. That's cute. Uh the next year it would pass and we would see another color TV game come out called the Color TV oh Game Kazushi. This would come out in seventy nine. And this had six versions of the game breakout. What's breakout? It's a top oh, I I thought you'd actually you actually knew. It's like one of Atari's no. biggest games, like Pong, kind of. Like, it's a very old class. If you look it up, you'll know exactly what it is. You've seen it a hundred times. Oh, let me look it up. I think okay. it's the one where the you, there's the blocks on top, and you the, bo- the ball breaks the blocks on the paddle mm-hmm. on the bottom. Oh, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, yeah Breakout. Oh, super, God, super yeah. popular, you know, common game. So this, yeah, this thing yeah. had six versions of Breakout on it. They couldn't get the rights to Breakout because it's Atari. So they, they made their own oh. version and called it Block Fever. Um, I like that. Yeah, so this uh, came out and it was very popular. Uh, and like, and the reason why it was so popular is Breakout was only available in America at the time. So Japan had actually never seen this game before. Oh, so they kind of Nintendo kind of spread it around, and the Kazushi was the first project product to actually display the red Nintendo name. Nice. So yeah, it's got the red name Nintendo on it, and this was a design a choice made by the case designer to start making Nintendo a more notable brand name. And the case was designed by a new hired Nintendo named Shigeru Miyamoto. Yeah, I know him. So this this is his first thing in Nintendo was the the color TV game Kazushi and the decision to make it have a cool case with a red Nintendo name on it. Yeah. The final entry into the color TV game series would be the computer TV game, which would release in the summer of 1980. And this was the, the time that home consoles hit an all-time low in sales. Arcades were rising, home consoles were falling, kind of thing. And a lot of the people who played games decided to play them on PCs instead of uh, sort of consoles. So, uh, the console market, this console, the the color TV computer, was made in very, very small amounts. Today, it's an extremely rare collector's piece again, if you can get one of these. The thing is, though, it's a very rare collector's piece, but almost all of them are in box because they just didn't sell. So, oh. so like almost all of these you find are inbox untouched kind of thing. That's kind of fun. Uh, and it was the first uh, fully in-house made console as well. Mitsubishi was not involved. And uh, the game featured uh, game design. The case was designed by Miyamoto. And the game inside was Othello. Computer Othello, I should say. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and is built around the original Computer Othello arcade board. They just made it smaller and put it in a thing. Uh, sales were horrible, which again mentioned <laughs> led to another. All most of the copies are unopened in warehouses and still exist out there today in some form. Mm. Uh, and this was the final entry to the Color TV series. This was the last. That that was gone. What a shame. We're going into the eighties now, which is a huge time for Nintendo, as you know. Yep, I was about to say maybe p- the starting of it all. Yeah, this is kind of where Nintendo became, you know, big ball boy, and uh, yeah. this was their rise in the arcade business. Uh, Yokoi is now leading the company's video game division with his partner, Shigeru Miyamoto, and is responsible for some of today's biggest vet, uh, legends. And this one is, this is a great story. I love this story. So one day in 1980, Yokoi was on his way to work and he, you know, people in Japan take uh, bullet trains to get, to get around usually. Right. So he's on the bullet train system and he notices something uh, where it's very crowded. There's a businessman next to him sitting down, playing with his calculator, just pushing buttons. For no reason. And he this inspired him. 
he was going to make a game that you could wear as a watch. So you could bring it with you, bring it into meetings, whatever, you know, play this little game, right? Wait, just to kill time. Right. So this was the first idea for a portable game. And Yokoi would later that day pitch it because he got to get into a car ride with Yamauchi. Uh, I think Yamauchi was going to Sharp, and he was in the car ride, and Yamauchi, and this is the story, Yamauchi sat with his eyes closed the whole time during the pitch <laughs> and made no response. Got out of the car, leaving Yokoi in the car to go back to Nintendo uh, to attend his meeting with Sharp. During the meeting, Yamauchi pitched the idea that Yokoi told him. And Sharp, <laughs> Sharp loved it. That's amazing. So he returned to Yokoi and told him, go forward with this idea. And so he did. He kept going and it went through a ton of redesigns. He abandoned the watch idea because it was just too small to really make any sense. And he ended up making right. a clamshell design for the case that we know for Nintendo very well today. Wow, yeah. Uh, and each side would have its own side being game A and game B. With game B <laughs> being a more difficult version of game A. And it used Fair. batteries to power it. And he would release the game in 1980 called the Silver Series Game and Watch. <gasps> That's right. You got you guys know the Game and Watch. A little a little guy, <gasps> Mr. Game and Watch. Uh, and so this initial design, the Silver Series, was so popular it sold 14 million units, which broke electronic Jesus. sales records in Japan in its first year. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. So the Game and Watch, massive hit. Nintendo launched into way big profits of the Game of Watch. Uh, so again, that's the first of Yokoi's like biggest things with Nintendo. I love it how it's like one of their big first successes was a handheld because Nintendo is like, yeah. has always loved it, their handhelds. It, it, they always do that. They look at it today. It makes yeah. it's that's what they they that's their thing. Convenience. It's like their whole thing. Yeah. So we would see in 1981 the release of a game made by Shigeru Miyamoto and Gunpei Yokoi, Donkey Kong. Yeah. This game would sell so well and so widely, I'm not even going to talk about it because I just don't need to. It could be its own episode, but like you guys know what Donkey Kong is. I know, we all know. Yeah. Um, so he would work, Yokoi worked on this. He led the product with his partner, Miyamoto, and they developed this game. It would not only shake the arcade world to its core and take it by storm, but its massive sales led to the home console releases of this product. Let's fucking go. The company Colaco, which is dead today, but back then was a giant, uh, would end up porting the games for the Colaco Vision, of course, their own console, the Intellivision, and the Atari 2600. So this was huge. This is the first time an arcade game became a home console game. Right. Uh, and Yokoi would go on to make a Game & Watch version of Donkey Kong 1982. And the first product, or problem in making this product, was the controls. The Game & Watch had an up and down button. And that was it. And a pause button. Those are all the buttons on the Game Watch. <laughs> and you can't do that with Mario. Because Mario in the arcade, you know, or not Mario, sorry, Donkey Kong, when you control Jumpman, you use a joystick. Jumpman. You know? It's got a joystick. Right. You left, yeah. up, and down, right. You go left and right. You can't yeah. put a joystick in a clamshell. It's too big. You can't do that. Can't so do he that. invented a four-way directional pad. The, the digital pad. Today, known as the D-pad. This was the invention of the D-pad. was the Donkey Kong Game & Watch. I was about to say, still used to this yes. day, the exact yep. same same thing, way. Basically. You dumb pay your koi, good job, you did it. Rest in peace. <laughs> you he died in like ninety eight, I think. He's been dead a long time. Oh. But yeah, wow. rest in peace. This would be extremely popular, and it would sell eight million copies alone. And I want to point out that the fourteen million of the Silver Series was four different games. So the single Donkey Kong game version of Game and Watch sold eight million. So that shows how popular it was. Um. And because this, the home console ports of Donkey Kong sold so well, this started a fad. And this fad st exists today. So you could call it not a fad, as a matter of fact. Uh, <laughs> or a longest running fad. Call it just culture. It, yeah, it, it's, call it culture I called it a fad because it did stop, but then it came back. Uh, which is oh. porting arcade games to consoles. Oh. And, it, it, <laughs> and it kind of exists today. Because like, a games like King of Fighters, the fighting game series, they're made for arcades first. Console second kind of thing so like right. that's you know they still do it today just a little bit um so many other nintendo titles would see feature releases on the home console and not just nintendo but about every other company like coloco and atari were having their console games now put on the on or arcade games i put on home console mm. and while arcade is a dying like i mentioned before while they're dying in america like it's really hard to find arcades granted the ones that you find are usually yeah. busy as hell 
<laughs> like they're open yeah. for a reason. Uh, yeah. In Japan, because well, they're, they're now they're like novelty things. Yeah, like, if exactly. You go to an arcade, exactly. You go there for a specific date or something. Yeah, but in Japan, which I'm down with, great date. Oh, oh absolutely. Wonderful. Arcades are fantastic dates. Like, go take your dates to arcades. That's how you know it's a keeper. Anyway, in Japan. They're everywhere still. They never stopped being popular, and they're bigger than ever today. Japan, ar- J- the Japanese arcane culture is also kind of run by Sega, funnily enough. But it's like oh, hmm. massive. They're huge in Japan, and we actually have I'm jealous of that. We have one out here in LA where we get the modern Japanese arcade games. I can't remember what it's called. It's called like like Next Life or something, or like Player Life or something. One Up, One Up. Yeah, that's it. One Up Arcades. It's a Japanese massive arcade brand that they're only one outside japan's in los angeles i was gonna say there is a one-up bar in la the one-up so. bar is yeah that's what i thought of no i, th- I th- it's not one up you're right god it's something close it's, i don't know anyway someone will someone will mention it um so in 1983 shigeru miyamoto and gunpei yokoi the two behind donkey kong would decide to make a new arcade game and in mm. donkey kong the hero jump man who in-house was jokingly called mario would die if you fell too far in the game Donkey Kong. So Yokoi suggested to Miyamoto, let's make a game where we have this Mario character, and he can fall from any height. And they agreed to give him superhuman abilities. And that's the basis of the game, which is hilarious to me. Uh, right. So the name Mario stuck. And uh, due to his overalls, hat, and thick mustache, and his design, they made him a plumber, which in the Jumpman version of himself, he's a carpenter in Donkey Kong. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, which is why that. he finds like hammers and like stuff. Like he's a carpenter. Yeah, yeah. So they changed it to plumber, and the game would be themed around the idea. And also, so the popular theory around the name is Mario Segal. 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 A. He was an Italian American landlord. That's why I went A. He was an Italian American landlord. A. Nintendo. <laughs> and he burst into their offices one day and demanded rent while they were having a meeting. That's fucking hilarious. Yeah, so that's where they think the name Mario came from because allegedly he had a big mustache and he was Italian. <laughs> so like that, he just became Mario. Um, that's so funny, dude. It's inspired by their landlord. Yeah, there's also a, there's also a story I've heard where there was a hot dog cart that Italian American got the mustache named Mario ran. Oh. And the series that's the same person, but he's never answered, and I don't think he's going to because I think he likes not answering that question. I think it's very funny to him. Uh, which, you know, power to you, Miyamoto. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, in this game, they also introduced the concept of a player 2, which would be a simple yeah. color palette swap of Mario, and keeping the Italian naming theme, they called him Luigi. <laughs> this game would be released in 1983 under the title Super Mario Bros., and this would be the legend we have today, starting here. Uh, not to be confused yeah. with Super Mario, by the right. way. Yeah. It's a different game. So don't... Right. Not that. Stop it. Uh, Super Mario Bros. The one where they go with the pipes and the back and forth and the black background. Yeah, That's this and, one. And you have hit the thing and then they fall down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so this would not only quickly outsell Donkey Kong, but it would be almost immediately within a month ported to home consoles. Oh yeah. And Nintendo was living on constant arcade success as well as Game and Watch systems being put out frequently, which they kept going to ninety eight. By the way, didn't know that. That's crazy. Oh, wow. I yeah. didn't know that either. They just That's never crazy. stopped making Game of Watches. And they never went up in quality either. They were still like little else, like bad <laughs> screen, you know, that you can't see anything on. Um, they already had Game Boys at that yeah, point, too. They were, like, they, were, they were like super cheap. That was the point. You go buy like, this really cheap little clamp thing for like a little kid, like a little, little kid, you know? Right. You know, like yeah, they, yeah. so that's kind of where they became until they eventually mm-hmm. died. And they, then now they make more. They still make the gold series today, which is like the original version, like with Game, Mr. Oh, Game of sure. Watch, you know, like fancy that kind of stuff. But yeah. So the game watches were selling, arcade games were selling. Nintendo decided they were going to make another big move in the industry, and that was to make a home console of their own. Oh my god! And this home oh console would be cartridge based, like others, not oh not disc, go. not floppy disk based, which was a hilarious argument to think of now. <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. One that this so this their idea was to make it would be able to, it would be a home console that could play these arcade ports at their arcade graphics levels. And their arcade responsive control levels, basing now a con- that's some, yeah, that's crazy a fucking high tall order. It it, it oh, is, man. and it it didn't make it, but uh, it would uh, <laughs> it would host its responsive controls because they used the D pad on the controller instead of the joystick. That was the big thing ah. they they pushed, like use this D pad, which at the time Nintendo was the only company using it. So it was like 
you know, it's very special to them, to them to use it. Right. And it would be designed by a man named Masayuki Yumera. Umura? Uyumara? Yumera. Uh, <laughs> using hardware <laughs> from the Donkey Kong arcade cabinet, the Radar Scope arcade cabinet, and Namco's Galaxian cabinet, which I think was illegal, but we'll overlook that. It was originally designed as a 16-bit system with a fully operating keyboard and a floppy disk drive to function as a home computer called the GameCom. Remember that? Console? Yep. Yep. No. 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 It never. It never. It never came out. Because uh, Yamauchi said, not only are these features are too expensive to be selling on every device, but they were too intimidating, stating that quote, only technophiles knew such devices. Oh yeah, you gotta have something you can just hit a button and it's on. Exactly. Which is not. He's not wrong. It sounds silly to say today, but in the eighties, right. running a computer and owning a computer was like a hobby activity. That was something that you didn't really do. People didn't do that actively. Right, that makes sense. So uh, he wanted the system to be easy to understand for every member of a family. So, you know, mom, dad, kid, dog, they can all use it. <laughs> the dog. And uh, the, they would set this up alongside the family TV. So that was the idea is it would sit next to your, like, Betamax player, <laughs> you know. Uh, did they have those in the 80s? Like, did they have a home video in the 80s? In 1980, 1985? Is that what year it was? No, 80. 83? It was 83. This is 83. Do they have home? Do they have VHS players in 1983? I don't know. Anyway, he wanted it to be a, a console adjacent to other things by your TV. So I'm guessing something like that. Um, and to be easy to understand. And uh, it was actually Uyumura? Uyumura? Uyumura's wife. The, yeah, the VHS came out in 1970. Okay, perfect. So there was VHS and Betamaxes at the time. Yeah. And they could be, you know, put it next to that. That was the idea. So uh, Uyumura, Uyumura's wife came up with the idea of calling it the family computer because it was neither a home or personal computer, and so the name Famicom was born. That's cute. I think I've heard that. That's actually. what it's called in Japan, it's the Famicom. Uh, the <laughs> system would release the con- they would release the system on July 15, 1983, under the easy to roll off the tongue name home cassette type video game family computer. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, oh, no. So it would have Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., and Popeye. You know, that that uh, that Popeye like Popeye game. The Sailor yep, Man? Popeye the Sailor. Very popular arcade game back All in the day. Right. All right. As its launch titles. However, it had a bad chipset on the motherboard. And this would result oh. in massive crashing issues. And so they ended up having a massive recall to bring their products back. Mm. And following their recall, they relaunched it under the much simpler name Famicom. With its new motherboard, it's much better. Uh, and it immediately took the home consoles market by storm, and within a month became the number one home console in Japan. Let's fucking go. So yeah, Let's go. if you look it up, you'll see it. it's red and white. It's called the Famicom Japan. It's the same as ours, just different name, different packaging, same insides. Yeah. Um, that's how it's always been called in Japan. Like if you look at games now, like in the Japanese version of the Switch store, it's called Famicom yeah. and Super Famicom, not Nintendo right. and Super Nintendo. So it's just their name for it. Um, and so yeah, it was so like Famicom sixty four. Famicom, no, not that unfortunately. <laughs> that was the, Fam- the Famicom Switch. The Famicom Wii. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah. The Fama Wii. Hold your family's Wii. Anyway, <laughs> Japan now had a home console of its own, and it was selling like crazy. This was the first Japanese home console, by the way, and it was so popular that they were approached by Namco and Hudson Soft to allow third-party games in their system for a 30% fee. Nice. Uh, they agreed, which we actually talked about this happening in the Square Enix episode in a little bit more detail if yep. we learned about that. Uh, but So they would agree, so you would be able to make third-party games for a 30% fee, which, for the record, that was the industry standard until 2010. So... 30% fee to have that's your actually, game on a third party thing. Which is a, I mean that's 30% is not bad. It's not bad, but it is a lot. Like, um I think it's lot, a, I think it's smaller now. Uh it should be. They agreed in uh uh 1984 that all types of games would be releasing for the Famicom from all companies, American, Japanese, whatever. You will come with us, get 30%, right. we'll print your game. Huh. So at this time Nintendo was taking Japan by storm. But America had its eyes in the real was the was the real prize Nintendo had its eyes on because he remembers that visit to Cincinnati and being so blown away by how big things could be in America that this whole time he had the goal that we have to make it in America. You know the whole Beatles thing. You got to make it. That was you like make the, it in America. Yeah. You make it big. 
I mean, that that was like the same thing that they said in the Square Enix episode, yeah. too. So. Yeah, well, this, that's actually about to happen here. Uh, so the North American market was the future, and they actually had a deal with Atari to release the Famicom in America under the name Nintendo Advanced Video Gaming System. And this deal was set to be finalized and signed publicly at the Summer Consumer Electronics Show in 1983. Hmm. However, during the show, Coleco had a demonstration where they showed Donkey Kong on their console without the rights. Oh. So, Atari didn't know this, and Atari saw that and panicked and said, what the fuck, Nintendo, you're working with Coleco, like, how are you doing this? And they backed, they kind of, like, paused the deal, right? Right. Uh, and so Atari delayed their decision, and soon after that, CEO of Atari, Ray Kassar, was fired, like, the next week, who was <laughs> running the deal, and so it just got forgotten. Like, oh, everyone just forgot. Forward. Everyone Nintendo and Atari, like, I guess it just never never was going to happen. Okay. <laughs> In 1984, Nintendo would release the Nintendo Verse system, which was a major success in the arcade world. This was a popular arcade cabinet that was able to switch between Nintendo games. Because it literally was just a Famicom. Uh, <laughs> and it would sell so well that arcades all over, even today, have these systems. If you ever go, if you go to like the arcades and like the Venice Boardwalk out here, that, that Mario system they have is, is a verse system. That's what it is. Oh, they still crazy. work. Like, that's how good these things are. They're still working yeah. perfectly fine. And, you know, oh, Nintendo's yeah. pretty known for that. So it makes sense. Yeah, that's they true. make very high make quality hardware. My N64 is still fine. Yeah. Mine, mine too. Mine work. I don't have a cable for it, but it works. It powers on fine. Uh, just don't have a TV like adapter thing, which I need to get. In uh, 1985, Nintendo announced it would release the Advanced Video Game System, or AVS, later that year in America. Despite having sold over 2.5 million units in Japan, Americans are very skeptical because the video game crash of 1983 was still major. Do you know about this incident happening? No. Video games just stopped selling in the early 80s in Japan. 1983, the market crashed. And it was so bad that businesses saw video games as a dead fad and would straight out not sell them. They wouldn't sell the console. Wow. They wouldn't sell the games. They're like, no one's going to buy them, so we're not going to order them. Uh, so because of that, Electronic Games Magazine even had a, an, ar an article titled The Video Game Market in America and How It's Virtually Disappeared. It's like it was a big, big problem. So the success of the Verse system, however, gave Nintendo the confidence that they could move forward with their plans and push a console out in America to get stores and sell it. To do this, however, like I mentioned, they had the stores weren't selling things, so they had to do some tricky, some tricky, tricky things, which is kind of great. Okay. Uh, stores were just not selling games, let alone any new console to come out. So to get around this, they changed the nomenclature of the product. And they called okay. it an entertainment system instead of a video game system. They called the body a control deck instead of a console. Okay. And they called the games game packs instead of video games. And while <laughs> this seems very silly today, what this did it legally does. and rights-wise was allow them to sell their system in toy stores. Where before, uh -huh. consoles were only allowed to be sold in electronic stores. Oh, wow. That's fucking sneaky. Yeah, so they basically just changed the wording, all legally, to allow them to be able to be sold in toy stores. And another thing that happened they had to worry about was, because of the game crash in 83, piracy was a huge issue in America for games, where it started. Oh. The Americans started the pirated wow. game industry because people weren't selling games. So what would you do? You would copy your game and sell it to people on the street. Wow, that's so fucking. That started so early. Yeah, but it, but you but it makes sense because they couldn't. People couldn't go to stores and buy them. So if you right. wanted to get a game for your system, you had to get a pirated copy, basically. And not only that, people would make custom or homemade games by editing the cartridges, which is rad as hell. I love that idea, and I'm, I love the idea of having one of those. That'd be so great to have like an Atari seventy six hundred or twenty six hundred like homemade game. You know what I mean? That'd be yeah. cool. Um, but more commonly, yeah, they sold just copies of games. Nintendo was worried about this, and so they invented the 10 NES lockout chip. This was the first anti-piracy measure in a game ever. Wow. And what this was, it was a lock and key style coupling, one in the control deck, one in the game pack. And if they didn't read each other from coming from a uh, Nintendo factory, it wouldn't turn the game on. That's cool. So 
to further this, each product also would come with a on the on the cartridge and the box would be a stamp saying the seal of quality, which is what we know today as their famous yeah. official Nintendo seal of quality. Yeah. So that was an anti-piracy measure to know you're getting a legit disc, a legit cartridge, which is it had that stamp oh. on it. Wow. Yeah. I'm learning so much about the little things. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I love that. It's cool that we have a little info out there. So yeah. due, due to that, you know, crash and stuff, they decided another way to go ahead in toy stores was to market the system to children. This is Nintendo of America had founded this, thought, thought this idea. Their American office was like, let's make this game for kids or this product for kids. And we're going to have a hard line censorship approach. No blood, sexuality, profanity, religion, or political content in any Nintendo products. They put the cross on Link's sheet. I know, and the graves of Final Fantasy. Uh, but yeah. uh, this censorship still pretty much exists today, you know? That Nintendo, they have other weird things in their systems now, but generally, especially right. Nintendo first-party products, they still follow this, like, rule. They're, they're, it's a little more sexualized, for sure. You know, Bayonetta yeah. exists. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, generally, yes. They, have, they like to follow at least their main characters. You know, they keep their kind of hard line on that. Right. Um, this would be Ev. This is there's two famous cases of this. One is Mortal Kombat, where when mm. you punch people instead of blood coming out of their body, it's spit, as the instruction manual says. And uh, Lucas Films Maniac Mansion was also uh, almost so censored it's unrecognizable in the NES. That's funny. Uh, they needed something, however, to push it for kids, and so they came up with the idea of the robotic operating buddy, also known as oh, no. Rob. So you probably know him from Super Smash Brothers. Yeah, but I know that he was in yeah. that before. Uh, yeah, I figured you do, but a lot of people, you know him from Smash, Rob. Uh, yeah. But yeah, what he was is he was a toy add-on that you would put on top of your NES. And he had small discs that he could hold, which is the thing he shoots in the Smash. Yeah. And they would play games. They were like game discs. They were, like, they were very basic and simple, but they were only available in America, which makes them pretty rare. Oh. That's kind of cool. And uh, they would end up releasing the system in 1985, changing the name right before the release to the Nintendo Entertainment System. Or the NES, as you know today. Mm. Right. So excitement for the pro product was relatively low. It had actually only released in Los Angeles and New York City. It was the only place you could get an NES. Oh, wow. And uh, But then the Rob came around, and it fucking exploded. And it exploded so much that in 1986, it got a, a nationwide launch and soon a Europe launch after that. And it would sell oh. 1.1 million units in a year alone, which broke records for console sales. Yeah, that's big at the time. And also, just so people understand, it was like $1,000. Yeah. So it was very expensive. Um, so the NES would outsell their competitors, the Sega Master System and the Atari 7800. Uh, the games would reach a record high. The NES would... Uh, top the console market and it would rejuvenate the whole game market in America. The first game to break a million copies was an NES exclusive, The Legend of Zelda. Yeah, so it was so popular, it broke a million copies, they actually ended up giving away Legend of Zelda copies with magazine subscriptions to Nintendo Power, too. That's awesome. So it was so popular, like, well, if we don't have it, here it is, kind of thing, like, get into your NES, it became huge. Uh, and this would be broken again very soon after a couple years. Uh, I think eighty nine, uh, they would it would break with one point seven million being sold for Final Fantasy. Right. So that that was the game that broke Zelda's record, and then it would be broken again with seven million copies sold of Super Mario Brothers three. Boom. So we went from one point seven to seven. That's a big jump in sa in sales numbers. And by the way. Super Mario Bros. 3 was the top-selling game in the world until 2006. Whoa. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Do you, you know what game beat it? Tetris. No. I don't it know. It came out in 2006. Oh. Oh. It was Nintendo. I'll give, you, I'll give you that. Can you guess what it was? 2006. Uh... The only thing, uh no, I don't know. We fit. Oh my god, really? Yep. That's so fucking funny. We Fit did it. Well, to be clear, it's called Wii Sports. It's a confusing thing to say because Wii Sports came with the Wii. But oh. when you bought Wii Fit, the game, it was called Wii Sports. 
But that's what it means. It means the fit game when you see that record. Wait. So wait. The fi- the fit game outsold. That's wild. Yeah. I don't. I never had it. It had like I never had it either. I never had that game. I mean, I'm not. I also wasn't an old person exercising with my Wii. I was a child. That's true. A teenager at the time. Yeah. Yeah, so, same. you know, like it wasn't, that wasn't art, <laughs> but yeah, it was a household thing. I know a lot of people who had Wii Fits in their house, so. That's crazy. Yeah. And by 1992, the NES sold 40 million copies worldwide, 30 million America. So that showed, so that's what Yamauchi was right. America was the future for Nintendo and it would be continue to be his focus for Nintendo into the struggles of the nineties, which we will go into next episode. Wow. So yeah, that was that was Nintendo from uh, Meiji period card company to game giant. <laughs> that's an awesome. That's I love this though. I love Nintendo. I'm a Nintendo fanboy, so it's it's very because my parents were on that censorship thing. They got yeah. me a Nintendo before anything else because they were like, "Oh, good. It's not. It doesn't have blood and guts or like tits everywhere." So that's what they got it for me. Yeah, when I was and I got a PS2 anyway. When I was growing up, my my parents didn't care about that. We had everything, but Nintendo was my favorite. And I think it's because they made games marketed to me, you know. That's true. So, yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I funny. liked. Um like I remember we actually had Mortal Kombat on the Sega and the SNES. Oh, wow. Because my dad big popular in that house. My dad got it to play it on the NES, said Super Nintendo, and was like this is Where's the book? Why isn't this is a bloody game? So he bought it again for the sake <laughs> to see the blood. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it was uh, yeah, Nintendo's great. Um, I actually played a lot with NES as a kid too because my brother would always be using the Super Nintendo, so I'd play around with the Nintendo. That's kind of cool. So you kind of like you you still had the early game introduction yeah, type thing. I did. I w- I for, yeah. I was yeah. I was born in ninety two, so I was born after Nintendo. Right. That was it. That ninety two was the end of the NES, basically. That's like the Super Nintendo's coming in. So like I was, we had. I remember having the NES. I remember hooking it up in the living room of my house instead of the den where my brother would play the Super Nintendo, just to be able to play a game at the same time. Right. Yeah. No. I. Uh, I, I didn't. I actually got into video games later because my first console was technically a Game Boy Color when I was living in Thailand because it was good. For, it was convenient to keep me distracted on planes. Yeah. Um, and then my like my TV first TV console was the N sixty four. My first game though people know was a Link to the Past because I played the Super Nintendo at my cousin's house. Yeah. And I was like, "What the fuck is this? This is amazing!" <laughs> like, Mine was Sonic the Hedgehog on the Sega Genesis. That was the first game I ever played. So that's awesome. Yeah, Sonic yeah. for life, dog. Show me that porn. I'm joking. Don't please stop it. Stop making Sonic oh, no. have sex online. <laughs> All right, guys, that's the end of the episode for that's Nintendo the, Part you. One. Next week we'll Hell be yeah. doing Part Two, so tune in for that. Thank you for listening. Thanks for being here. I loved video game history ones, so it's always a pleasure to do. Yeah. All right. Good night, guys. Have a good night, everyone.